I would like to invite the two of you all to discuss and elaborate upon the conversation that was begun tonight. Well, I'd like to begin by saying that when I finished my talk, I went to Deepak and I said, well, does that sound accurate to you? And he said, yes. And he said to me, he said, well, I think the most important thing that you said was what you said at the end. You said that none of us know the outcome of this adventure. And you said that if you can surrender the fruits of action completely, you can start to be freer and freer and freer until, in fact, you can achieve liberation. And I said to him, well, many years ago I'd gone to visit him and asked him to participate in some harebrained scheme that friends of mine had asked me to ask him to participate in. And he and I had been sitting, and he said to me very quietly, he said, well, it may all go, it may all be destroyed, but increasingly I, he was talking about himself, I'm living in my inmost being, and I am at peace with this. And it was the first time that I'd ever heard anybody say the unspeakable. And it was such a relief. So I was able to say to him, thank you so much for having said that, because all the other teachers are in a triumphalist mood. And that triumphalist mood, rah, 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 we're going to get through, we're human beings, we're God's children, that triumphalist mood is not helpful, is it, at this moment? Because something, I think, much humbler and much more profound and much more peaceful and far more passionate has to come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the very essence of your talk tonight was that, um, uh, and you did it very articulately, very beautifully, very passionately, was that destruction and creation go hand in hand, you know, and actually um, we can say the same thing in many ways, that birth and death go hand in hand. You can't have a birth unless you have a death, and you can't have creation unless you have destruction. So actually when you look at Shiva's different uh, faces, creation, is, or different expressions, creation, uh, a short moment, a very, very short transient moment of maintenance, and then a destruction, and then an incubation, and then a resurrection or creation again. Those are the five expressions of Shiva. And uh, uh, that's happening at every level. So, you know, if you look at uh, quantum levels, fundamental levels of nature, then creation and destruction are having, are taking place at the speed of light. So at this moment, if you could see the universe as it really is, not through our perception, because our perception is very misleading. It tells us the earth is flat, that things are solid, that uh, you know we are standing on stationary ground while it's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space <laughs> at thousands of miles an hour. So our perception is misleading. If you could see the universe as it really is, at the most fundamental levels, you know, let's say you had quantumized, you know, divineized, like Krishna gives to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, then you'd see that the universe is a huge electromagnetic storm that's appearing and disappearing at the speed of light, okay, which is 186,000 miles per second. <laughs> okay, it's born and it's recreated. And it's breathed out and it's breathed, breathed in. in. At that speed. No, it happens at uh, atomic levels. It is. The shelf life is a little longer. The molecules, the shelf life is a little longer. Organs, bodies, it's longer. But when you take infinity as your background, it's all very fast, okay? It's transient. This birth and death, this creation and destruction, these days, it's referred to by physicists as called the discontinuity. Okay, so while the universe or you and I and everything here to our senses appears continuous, it's actually not. It's on and off. For every on, there's an off. For every off, there's an on. And it's happening all the time. Can I take a minute over this? Of course. So, you know, you go to see a movie. It's a continuous experience to your perception, but if you go to the projection room, it's a series of still frames that go on and off. You move them fast enough. You can't see the off. You can only see the on, because it happens so fast. You see continuity, but it's not. So to, or you see a Christmas light going around the Christmas tree, and there's no light going around the Christmas tree. 
it's going on and off. You know, the light bulbs are going on and off in a certain sequence, so you see a moving light, but there's no moving. So to this whole of creation, now, you know, we've been sitting here together. Um, we've gone on and off many times at that level. So we are right now dying, being destroyed, and being recreated. Okay. Mm. Now, why does Andrew look the same to me, uh, even though he's gone on and off a few million <laughs> times since we're sitting? You know, we're sitting for a bit, and he's kind of at that level. He's been destroyed and reconstructed. Okay, many times over, but he still looks the same. That's because every time he comes on, there's a slight change. And it's so slight that it's not perceptible to oh. my eyes. Okay, it's not perceptible to my eyes. But there is a change. And we all have to do is I remember him when he was a young man of 23. I've seen pictures. Looks quite different. <laughs> okay. So there's a change. Every time you come on, there's a slight change. You're not the same person. So there's some power that destroys you, then reassembles you, and reassembles you, and almost the same as before, and that's because of memory. You know, there's a f memory in the universe. The universe destroys itself, recreates itself, and because of memory, it usually he doesn't come back like a rhinoceros. He comes back like Andrew Harvey, okay, <laughs> because of that memory. Now, what we call the big death is when this whole thing finally goes off completely, because you know the karmic software can't be downloaded anymore. It goes off completely. Then he's gone off, and then he comes on, you know, and that on is a little quantum leap. Mm. Okay, uh, it's 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 the same karma, but uh, new meaning, new context, new relationships, new maybe a slightly new archetypal themes. So the next time he comes on, he's not totally predictable. Okay. And that's what we were saying, what you're saying, you know, that this destruction, we may never come on like this or like this, but we will come on, okay? As something maybe we can't imagine right now, uh, where Rumi says, when I die, I will soar with angels, but when I die to the angels, what I shall become, you cannot imagine. <laughs> yes. Isn't that? I think, I think that's from one of his books. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Please go on, quote you from mine. It's so fascinating because in the mystical systems we have exactly the same perception. For example, the Sufis know, they say, that the universe is born from the source at every second. Mm -hmm. And the true perception is to see and live in this perpetual springtime. They call it mm -hmm. this perpetual springtime of the rose garden. This astounding wonder. And the Zen masters tell us that there is actually no correlation between the wood and the ashes. They are totally different. We say the ashes come from the wood, but at every stage they are different. Because if you're living in the total present, you are witnessing this death-rebirth process at every moment. Mm -hmm. What fascinates me is the psychological and mystical repercussions of this death rebirth process because what I have learned from my own experience which is not unique to me it's the archetypal experience that Deepak and everybody who's been on this journey has experienced is that you do have to go through a death to be born in the divine dimension or to be beginning to be born in the divine dimension and that death is known by many names in the mystical systems, but its fundamental name is the dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. And it is a horrible process because when you are ready for this death, you are stripped of everything that you've relied on for your identity at that moment. You lose your agendas, your illusions, your fantasies, your beliefs in yourself. And it feels like and smells like and tastes like atrocity beyond imagining. It is an awful process. But if you know this secret of the death rebirth in the universe, and if you have read the authentic mystics, like Rumi, like Jesus, the Christian mystics, the Hindu mystics, the Vajrayana mystics, who all of whom know this, then as you're going through this, you have the courage to surrender to this, because you know that in unimaginable ways, 
through the mystery of the mystery, you will be reborn as something different and miraculous. And what's so important about what Deepak is saying about the death-rebirth process in the whole universe, and what I am saying, echoing what he's saying, in the psychology of the human and of the mystical transformation, is that once this law is embraced, you can really begin to enter what this time that we are living through is really about. And what it is I really about, I believe, is an apocalypse, which is the birth canal of a new divine humanity. The fish had to get out of that swamp because it was horribly polluted. They had to get onto the sand and they had to die in droves and suffer and subject themselves to a totally inhospitable environment and they had to die and be reborn in another dimension and in that dimension they actually in the end grew organs which enabled them to fly. I think humanity is at exactly that moment. The apocalypse is the manifestation of our deepest desire to be transfigured. We have manifested this. It has been allowed to manifest. It is our evolutionary um, destiny to go through this. And if we can learn this death-rebirth process, submit to it, surrender to it, keep calm within it, trust it, it will rebirth us in ways and in forms that not even Deepak <laughs> Can imagine. None of us can imagine. None of us can imagine. This See, is a mystery. The, this the discontinuity again, it's the off part. The, you know, there's birth, there's death, there's creation, there's destruction, and then there's the interval in between, the discontinuity. And today, if you ask scientists who keep up with this kind of thing, not all scientists do, but the ones that do, they'll tell you, say, say what's in that discontinuity? They'll say five things for sure. Um, we had a conference at our center for one week where I invited some of the world's most prominent scientists, including Hans-Peter Dürer, who was the protege of uh, uh, Heisenberg, yeah. etc. And so we asked them, so for one week, that's all we asked them, what's in the discontinuity? And this is what they say. This, there's no controversy about this. Uh, there's controversy about other things, but uh, which I'll mention in a moment, but what I'm saying right now, there's no controversy. In the discontinuity, there's no energy, there's no information, there's no space-time, there's no objects. The void. Okay? Yeah, so what's the void? Yes. And they say, it's a field of possibility waves. <laughs> possibility waves. Uh -huh. And there, it's infinite possibilities. That's the first thing they say. The second thing they say is there's, there's something called non-local correlation or a causal, non-local, quantum mechanical interrelatedness where everything is inseparably correlated, interdependent and synchronized with everything else. And this correlation does not require the exchange of energy or information signals because it's instantaneous. It's across space-time. So if it's across space, it's also across time. Past, present, and future are correlated instantly without energy or information signals. The third thing they say is that there's a proliferation of uncertainty. The deeper you get into it, the more chaotic, the more turbulent, the more uncertain, the more uh, unpredictable. unpredictable it becomes. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing is these quantum leaps, you know, from here to here without going through the space in between. Uh, it's like, beam me up, Scotty. And <laughs> Scotty disappears here, he's somewhere else. And the fifth thing they say is observer effect, that unless there's a conscious being looking at the discontinuity, it doesn't come on. You know, you've got to switch it on by looking at it and or intending to switch it on. Now, you know, as you listen to this, then <coughs> you start to say, you know, that's what consciousness is, of isn't it? it? Is. This is the unified field. This is the it? unified field. Consciousness yes. is a field of possibilities. Yes. It yes. correlates everything. Right now, you know, in your body there are a hundred trillion cells doing a hundred thousand things every second. A human body can think thoughts, play a piano, kill germs, remove toxins, make a baby all at the same time, you know. 100 trillion cells is more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. <clears throat> How do they keep track of what they're doing and synchronize their activities? 
non-local correlation. What's doing it? Consciousness is doing it. The spirit is doing it. And the consciousness can move from here to there without going from here to there. I can think of my mother in New Delhi and then think of Wall Street in Washington. I don't have to fly all the way. You know, I can go from there to here without going through the space in between. So this must be the mind of God. Okay, this is how all of creation is happening. And in here is the birthing of what he's talking about. So this is that moment maybe of that punctuated disequilibrium. The, the fish would learn to walk and then it learned to fly. Now if you believe Darwin, that, oh, you know, that rodent suddenly grew feathers. And that doesn't make that rodent more, more um, you know, survivable. Because, you know, for a rodent to have feathers, it makes it rather cumbersome, actually. So Darwin's idea that this is adaptation and, you know, survival of the fittest, well, it's that not very fit yeah. for, for the... It's strange and more yeah. extravagant and more mysterious. This is a creative process. Yes. There has to be the birth of wings, a new skeleton, a new metabolism, a new heart, navigational skills. It's all at once synchronized, you know, all at once synchronized of this into this with no space in between. So creativity, all creativity, all creativity is non-algorithmic, it's in that discontinuity, it's quantum. And it's an attribute of God's consciousness. So, you know, Darwin wasn't quite right. I was didn't really it's get so all the way. so fascinating about what you're saying, and this is really, I think, a huge clue for what the real meaning of sacred activism is, is the following. If we are able, through this fusion at the deepest level of mystical understanding and passion and stamina and peace, with clear focused action, to birth a new kind of spirituality and a new kind of action, we actually shift the quantum field of possibilities mm -hmm. in such a way that we connect directly with this divine mind and it can start working through us and opening doors where we could only now see walls, opening possibilities in what we now only see as terminal disaster. In the I Ching it says, heaven will not bless the uninnocent. And all the ancient civilizations knew that humanity needed to be through humility and surrender and reverence and the cultivation of true sacred joy in connection with the divine for the world to continue. They knew that. And I think they also knew that through that connection all kinds of divine miracles would be done normally mm -hmm. through the human. So that if people could only recapture that ancient knowledge and connect it to precisely the kind of new scientific knowledge that you're talking about, then the sense of meaninglessness and horror and desolation and despair would dissolve and a sense of the infinite possibilities of a heightened consciousness expressing itself in a new form of action could give birth to a new humanity mm -hmm. and a new world. Mm -hmm. And that is really what I think this fusion of action and mysticism is about. It's it about is. giving access to this field, this quantum field of transformative grace. Mm -hmm. And nobody, I, I, that's what I said to Deepak after the talk, I said, you're the only person who can help me on this, which is of course he's now done <laughs> beautifully, because I don't really understand how that's, and I've read everything, but until I'd, he just explained it to me, all, all these different layers of it, I didn't really understand how exquisitely and exactly that correlates with what a mystic experience is as they awaken. And what a mystic experience is as he or she awakens is that reality becomes a transparent dance more and more. And the impossible becomes possible. And miracles start to happen normally because your consciousness is allowing the influx of the mind that shifts the whole field of what we call reality so that a wholly new energy can enter it. This is the clue to the transformation of the planet, I believe. Yeah, but you said something very important. I think it's very important to understand the dynamics of that. You know, you said, in the end, all you can do is surrender. 
Okay, and Rumi says it also in yes. one of his poems where he says, our helplessness is the way. Yes. Okay, doesn't he say that? Yes. Now, while we can imagine, and that's an amazing attribute of the spirit, you know, imagination is not something that is an activity of a synaptic networks. It's your spirit that imagines, and then the synaptic networks carry out the, execute the order. While we can imagine and imagination is a never-ending horizon, while we can also intend, we must surrender at the same time. Because at the moment you don't surrender, from just a very simple understanding, the moment you get attached to a very specific outcome, That's you it. limit possibility waves. Okay, But as soon as you surrender to the wisdom of the proliferation of the uncertainty in that chaotic soup, in the discontinuity, then the possibility waves are infinite. Mm -hmm. And you know, then there's the, the confluence or the interlocking of some of those possibility waves. The constellation. The, the constellation. Yes. And it's the precipitation of a new reality, yes. which is much bigger than you had even imagined. And this is the hardest thing for us to do, isn't it? This is why training in spiritual practice and reading the great mystics and really, really coming to experience more and more of this playful and devastating mystery is so important. Because in my experience, and I'm sure in yours, this, this evolution is done in the following way. Do you, do you remember Indiana Jones when he gets to the mm -hmm. abyss? Yes. And he, there is no way he will cross from here to there. Mm -hmm. And he has to take a leap in the dark. He, he takes a step forward and a step appears, but only one. So he has to continually make that leap in the dark. And why we need this trust and surrender more deeply, I think, at this moment than at any other moment in our history, is because if we do surrender now, in the middle of this archetypal explosion of the opposites, we will be given the steps. But until we surrender, the steps cannot appear. They cannot appear. And this is extremely hard, if not impossible, for the ego to understand. But it's something that does become a, your real experience when you have surrendered as far as one can. Mm. And you find that reality then fans open. And miraculous things, synchronicities, meetings, possibilities, mm -hmm. come naturally because the next step appears. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that five or six thousand times, mm -hmm. you realize that you will be guided forward. Mm -hmm. You will be carried forward. You will be shown the way. But you need to stay extremely humble, extremely prayerful, extremely reverent, and extremely discriminating. Because in that field of proliferating possibilities, the truth and the shadow of the truth, which looks like the truth, will appear together very, mm -hmm. very often. Mm -hmm. So cultivating sattvic discrimination, the clear unstained mirror, mm -hmm. is the only way in which you'll be able to tell a real step from a step that has a trapdoor in it, which mm -hmm. will mire your feet. So this is very, very delicate. It's very difficult good. work, and it's unaccessible to the full self. It cannot be done in the full self. One of the things that I tried to say in my talk was something that I've been, and I, it's overwhelmed by really, in, which is the knowledge that whatever we do in the full self will not work now. Mm -hmm. And I give an example, and this is not a criticism of Ted Turner. Ted Turner had a billion dollars. He gave it to the United Nations. Well, the United Nations is fantastically corrupt and, I mean, in so many ways, absolutely unable to address any of the major problems of the world because it's in a bureaucratic mindset, which is part of the problem that are creating these sure. problems. So, what would an enlightened being have done with that billion dollars? I don't know. I hope I found out because I'd like to be enlightened and I'd like to have a billion dollars to do it. But I know that it would have been much stranger, much more mysterious, would have looked crazy to the world, of money and power, but would have had that quantum mischief. And I think it's mischief. Because one of the beautiful things you said in the, in the, um, that, that short paragraph you wrote is that, 
this transformation wears the eternal smile of a child. Mm -hmm. And what I think you come to understand about the mind and of God is what Heraclitus says, God is a child playing chess. Mm -hmm. And this childlike, innocent, mischievous, playful, exquisitely joyful, fascinated, wonderstruck power is the power of the transformation. Mm -hmm. That is the Ananda, that is Krishna, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's the Krishna side. Totally. And without that, we will always be the slave to our pessimism, our despair, our desolation, our sense of tragedy, our sense of limitation. And as I progress and as we all progress on this path, more and more and more that divine child is born in us with the capacity to surrender and the capacity to play. And if you marry surrender with playfulness, you have the clues, I think, to this transformation. Does yeah, yes, yeah, surrender, sense? playfulness. At the same time, the playfulness is imaginative, so the intention, imagination is all there at the same time, you yes. know. And um, while you were talking about the false self, uh, there's a beautiful poem of Tagore where he says, um, I go to my tryst um, to meet my lover, but who is this who follows me in the silent dark? <laughs> he adds his loud voice to everything I say. He has such a swagger <laughs> and he's so belligerent and it's my own little self, my lord. I'm ashamed to come to your house in his company. You know. And <laughs> it's that's that that's what we try to do when we try to change the world with all these billions of dollars that you were talking about. When the the only way the world can be changed, you know, I've really thought about this a lot because as a physician, you know, I was trained in a reductionist approach. So you, you have a problem, you fix it. Then you have another problem, you fix that. You have this problem, you fix that. It's a very reductionist model, you know. Um, and um, this is what these guys are trying to do. You know, you have AIDS, get the drugs there. You know, AIDS is not the drugs. It's 250,000 sexual contacts in the brothels of Bombay every night, and truck drivers, and disempowerment of women, and a bunch of other things, you know. And you would never solve AIDS by pouring in money. Right. So, in fact, when you, the moment you pour in money, power mongering, influence peddling, corruption, bureaucracy, <laughs> they all creep in. There's a politician to be bribed in Africa, there's a lobbyist involved in Washington, there are pharmaceutical companies buying for this. Five cents goes to help, the 95 cents fills in coffers and banks in Switzerland for corrupt and people. for carpets and, in offices in Rome. Uh, in yeah. Rome. So, you know, I think the most important things we can do are intangible. And they don't cost money. It's the things you were talking about, you know. Love, compassion, sharing of suffering, being there, giving attention, listening. This is all... Uh, empowering people by lifting their self-esteem, uh, invoking the divine feminine uh, in the men and women in these little villages, and suddenly, and people are doing work in that like area. Grameen. Don't like you think Grameen. that is an extraordinary? Yeah. that is a divinely inspired. Absolutely, because it's playful, and mm. it says, "Oh God, the corporations are never going to do it. The governments are going to do it. Billion dollars could Nations. have gone to Grameen. Right. Or there's there's a woman here, by the way, which whom you might want to interview. I just found out that I went to medical school with her. Her name is Monica Sharma. She works in the United Nations. And, you know, she's yes, one of those wonderful. few people in the UN who's going out in the field. And her only object is to empower women into leadership skills and increase their self-esteem. And wherever she goes, the incidence of AIDS comes down, children go to school, economy improves, and, you know, she's not spending those billions of dollars to do that. What you're saying is so important, I think, because we really still believe in our culture that we can fix all of this. Yeah. And that we can fix it with our technology and our money. This is the fantasy that has created the problem in the first mm -hmm. place. And that and it it won't work and this whole situation has been, I believe, designed by the divine to humiliate and destroy mm -hmm. all of those fantasies mm -hmm. and agendas. You can never cure 
things by trying to fix problems. <laughs> okay? You can never do that. What we need to do right this moment is surrender and create something that never existed before. Okay? Well, this uh, brings me to my next point. What has never existed before is the empowerment of the grassroots. Mm -hmm. What has never existed before is what Grameen did, which mm -hmm. is simply to give $50, wasn't it, to every poor woman who wanted to start That's a business. It, we have to really face the facts that the corporations, it will take the strip mining of the entire world before the corporations wake up to the fact that they cannot make love to a corpse. They'll find this out, but it'll take time. It will take endless disaster before the politicians give up their lying and their games. We have to face that the divine is saying to us, all these power structures of money and the rest of it are just finished. They're finished. They can only feed themselves. But that, we're not lost, we're not abandoned. There are so-called ordinary people with broken open hearts who are having potentially divine consciousnesses who can be brought together by the internet, by the alliance, by all the amazing new forms of communication and grassroots constellations and clusters of people without very much money and without very much power can be empowered at fundamental levels to make fundamental changes. The great birth is not going to be done from the top down, it's going to be done from the bottom up and it's going to be done by people who just have had enough and no longer believe in any of the structures that are in place and start to come together in the spirit of the Divine Mother in democratic fellowship and unity with great mutual respect and great urgency and amazing things can be done in that way. Because that, more, that really does reflect, I think, something of the basic nature of the universe, mm -hmm. which these power structures are in complete negation of. Mm -hmm. So I have faith in that. I remember, have you read Gustav Speth's wonderful book called Red Sky at Morning? Gustav, he's the, one of the world experts on the environment. He's a professor at Yale on the environment. He's a very sober person. The book is a devastating book. And at the end of it, he says, let's face it. I've sat on every committee. I've met every world leader. Nothing is going to work from the top down. They're not going to change. They're not. They don't <coughs> want to. They're in denial. They have every reason to go on playing the games that they're going as long as possible. God bless them. We don't have to hate them. But, he says, the only way that we will change is what he called jazz. And that is the improvisational coming together of like minds and like hearts. And this is what I think your website is going to be able to yeah. help get born. Don't you I think, think so? so you it's know. this kind of jazz, isn't yeah. it? What is the internet? I often wonder, you know, uh, uh, what is it? It's like the Akashic record in manifestation. Absolutely. You know, it's the mind of the mother. It's in the cloning of our collective soul, <laughs> I think, <laughs> you know. And it's yeah. the quantum field too, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, potentially? it is the quantum field. Yes. You know, one of the best examples of everyday quantum leaps of creativity in biology is when a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Now, for those people who don't know what really happens, at a certain stage of its development, the caterpillar starts to be more consumptive than it should be. So its consumption exceeds its metabolic needs. At this point, the body of the caterpillar starts to decay and starts to die. But within that body of the decaying caterpillar, there are a few cells which scientists actually call them the imaginal cells. Imaginal the cells, imaginal. how marvelous. Because they they're imagining, their, yes. okay? <laughs> yes. And in the beginning, the, the, the immune cells, they look at these imaginal cells and they say, hey, they, they, these don't belong, they attack them. But for some reason, the imaginal cells don't react. They're like as if in choiceless awareness. And, you know, they're just, just doing whatever. nothing, whatever. <laughs> and then after a point, the immune cells give up. And then these imaginal cells, not only do they start to gather in clusters, so the cluster here, cluster there, cluster there, but then the clusters start to connect. And then something even more interesting happens, they start to grow in, uh, in the number of imaginal clusters grows, the connectivity grows, and they start to use the dying carcass uh, of the caterpillar as their nutritive soup. Right. Okay, so it becomes the culture medium in which they grow. And when that connectivity of the imaginal cells, the clusters of the imaginal cells, reaches what we call a critical threshold, 
then on that particular day, a dormant gene that's been lying there all the time asleep, it wakes up and it has the machinery, the information code to create a butterfly. Now this butterfly is not just a worm with wings. This butterfly is a new, uh, creature. Is a new creature. New wings, new metabolism, new skeleton, new heart, new antenna, new eyes, navigational skills. You know, the woman, the evolutionary biologist who was telling me this thing the first time I heard it, she said, it's like your you left your bicycle at the repair shop and then you went to pick it up and there was a Gulfstream jet. <laughs> and you know, they said, it's the same thing. You left, I'm going to try this. You, 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 this but you, you left <laughs> this last week. Yeah. So it's a quantum creativity, you know, yeah. it's that same it's thing. thing. Now, I was thinking, because you brought this up just now in, as a thought, because you know, all the stuff that's happening, the war, the terrorism, the global warming, uh, the, the, the radical poverty, the uh, human rights that are being, you know, stripped off people, social injustice, this is the nutritive soup of the of dying, dying carcass and this is of the, the old paradigm. Cells are feeding are of feeding this. of this. Yes. And what we're going to do with our, this new yes. Google of the new humanity, the yes. website, is we're going to the imaginal cells are there. All we need to do is now connect the synaptic networks of the planetary mind, That's and it. then that information code will wake up. And the dormant gene, the div divine consciousness, it will, will infuse up. it. Yeah. I, I had a, it's, it's exactly what's going to happen, I believe, because I, I, I really have been thinking very, you know, meditating deeply on what, what the way through, and I had a dream in which I saw written in letters of fire, networks of grace, hmm. networks of grace, and what Deepak and his co-conspirators have created in the Alliance is a network of grace, because Everybody who's been here this weekend have experienced the strange synchronicities of meeting people they need to meet. You sit down and the person you need to have a conversation with is sitting right next to you and it happens in this exquisitely natural, normal way. This is how the networks of grace, the imaginal cells, will come together by the attraction of the soul. And if these networks of grace keep themselves clear by constant shadow work, and deep work on the ego, and deep surrender to each other in communion, then they will cluster together and through great powers like the internet and television, they will start to communicate under the radar of the corporations, under the radar of the governments, under the radar of the, the people who are mind blind and heart blind, God bless them all and may they all achieve enlightenment, and new worlds will start to just arise. The butterfly of the new divine humanity will come out of this. This is how it's going to work. And it's such a wonderful way to, for it to work. Our fantasy is that it all has to come from us, that we have to be powerful and rich and famous and the whole business of it. God is amused at this. <laughs> and is saying, well, that's not so bad, all of those things. There's nothing wrong with all that, but it's not going to work in this apocalyptic situation. So. Let's, let's have the emergence of divine humanity. The Christ, you know, there's this myth at the center of the, the whole Christ journey of the second coming. And the people who call themselves Christians imagine that this is going to be some Star Wars avatar appearing, you know, who looks like a Brad Pitt, because of course it's going to be blonde, isn't it? It's not going to be dark, because good God knows what would happen then. But the second coming is the clustering together of the networks of grace, the feeding off the soup of the apocalypse, and the rising of the yeast of divinity to create the new bread that's going to be broken, which is the bread of the new communion. And it's going to be done by all of us who love and care and are selfless and want to work together and want to play together. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think preserving that sense of fun is important, don't you think so? And that's why we have to understand these rhythms of death and rebirth. They're very serious. Which is the story of Christ, you know? It is. Isn't it? The, story, the resurrection and the death and the crucifixion, they're all... It's the dance of Shiva, actually. The it's, the dance, it's the same myth, it's the same reappearing. Myth, yeah, yeah. It's always that myth. It's, it's, the, it's so, that the story myth. of Rumi. Rumi falls in love 
his beloved is murdered probably by his own yeah. son. He goes crazy. He is stripped and burnt and seared beyond imagining. And three years later in Syria, the great realization happens that I am he and he is me. And the game is over. He's living in eternity. Mm. He's living as eternal love. And he lives for 30 years radiating this to everybody, transforming everybody who comes close to him. And he's still living and he's still bestowing this astounding grace upon humanity. And I know this because I had this hilarious experience, which I'd love to show you, which is I was asked by some TV company to go and make a film on Rumi. And we was, I persuaded the director of the museum in Konya to be able to read Rumi's death poems, which are all immortality poems, by his grave, this fabulous grave, which is come. And as I was reading the death poems, I started to laugh. And they said, my God, he's reading death poems by the tomb of Rumi, and he's laughing. So they stopped filming. And he said, why on earth are you laughing? This is really serious. And I said, I'm laughing because I'm supposedly reading about a dead poet, but there's so much power for coming from that tomb <laughs> that it's just wave after wave of this volcano of divine love that is, I can hardly stand up. And I'm not, I wasn't claiming to be especially sensitive. You, I mean, you have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to feel this immense power because this man is a realized being. He's living forever. This, the tomb of his body is a concentration of this radioactive power of divine passion. It's coming. And that night, I went to see a friend who owns a carpet shop in Konya, who is a sort of closet Sufi, and he opened the book that he'd been reading. And it was a 16th century Sufi master saying, when you go to Rumi's tomb, what you will feel is the volcano of divine passion. And this volcano will never be finished until the Day of Judgment. And he closed it's the beautiful. book. And yeah. that's what we're talking about. We're talking about beings who go through the death-rebirth process out of surrender to divine love, so that the false self, which is an atom in a way, can be exploded to release the Hiroshimic power of divine passion. That is a power which is a quantum leap. And those beings who are in that state, the, I mean, His Holiness is, a lot of His Holiness it seems to me to be in that state. And you, mm -hmm. you feel it around, and people say who know Him, that you can tell when He's turned last way. Mm -hmm. That there is a, a shift in the atmosphere. He's a very humble person. He's, very. And He's not playing any games. He's not pretending to be anything. But love has exploded within Him. And it has created this field of grace. This is what we all can do if we're prepared to die into love. Love is inviting us to that death, and it's offering us this transfiguring power to change everything. So, my message is, come and die. You'll find something fabulous at the other end of that death. And this is so much what Deepak is talking about, in all the different forms that he talks about it, but what seems to me so moving about what he's doing is, is how scrupulously he can connect it to the exploding understanding of science. I think that is probably, the, if all the things that you do, that's almost the most wonderful thing, because you're checkmating them in their own terms, and I think that's right. That's fortunate. Your connection, connecting the quantum field yeah. of love with the quantum field oh, well. that is explored out there, and that is a very cheeky thing to do. <laughs> I was fortunate. Too.